like maybe Hikaru thinks uh, like I'm a piece of shit because of the last game. Welcome back everybody to another C Squared podcast. We are back in business and more energetic than ever as usual. Uh, Fabi, you just got back from the Isle of Man. We are both on the same continent for uh, the first time in quite some time. So uh, good to have you back in uh, North America. Uh, tell us a bit about your travels. Let's start with, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the last time we talked was after you won against Hans. That was a great victory, obviously. Things slow down a little bit afterwards, but let's discuss Isle of Man. Yeah, that was the last time we uh, we recorded an episode. And uh, yeah, that was a good game against Hans. Uh, not Not from his point of view, of course. He didn't have his best day. He actually had a very up and down tournament and I had, um, unfortunately that was sort of the highlight, like those first two games. So it started very well and then it slowed down, but still kind of progressed. And then I had the, uh, t the game, which sort of ended my hopes for fighting for first place, but I already felt like fighting for first place would be very difficult at that moment because, um, yeah, I had slowed down a bit too much. That's, that's the issue. So plus four with two games to go. It was not in a bad position, but it wasn't um, wasn't really in a in a great position to fight for first. We saw even Hikaru, for example, after he won that game. Yeah, he was still unable to get first place. So it was just very unusual that plus five didn't cut it, but Vinted went plus six. Yeah, which um, it was clear that because of the tie breaks, people kind of knew where they were standing. So a lot of people just had to win, and Vinted was one of those those people because his tie breaks were not great because um, he lost the first game so he kind of knew he had to win and he kept winning game after game that that was the reason why uh why plus six is what uh, is what happened in the tournament why plus five wasn't enough yeah it's very unusual like ali reza won with plus five last time uh plus four was enough for second place when i made it yeah uh two years ago right mm -hmm. so it, it was just um People just had to to really like start winning every game one after the other, and Vidit was the one who managed to do that. Hikaru had a great event, uh, second place. It it confirmed his qualification, although he was very likely going to make it anyway. But obviously, better to to be safe. Save the story. Yeah. He's, he's confirmed in the candidates, and Vidit is confirmed in the candidates. And this this tournament kind of clarified almost everyone. Um, there's still two places to go, but we have a high degree of likelihood for both of those two places. So we can almost guess who all eight players will be in the candidates at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll be covering that in just a second. Let's uh, do discuss, take it back a couple of uh, notches. And I, I had a question. I had something on my mind uh, previously. Um, I actually did not expect you will go to the Isle of Man after he qualified to the candidates. Uh, what prompted that decision to, you know, just uh, continue with your current plans and continue uh, playing this tournament travel? Because, you know, it, it's not just playing. It's also a lot of traveling. You're coming from North America. You have to go um, settle for, let's say, a few days in Spain, which you did. Um, just kind of get used to the time, time, uh, time zone and then go play and then come back to North America to play uh, the Rapid and Blitz and the Singfield Cup. So there's a lot of time changes that go into the equation, into your calculations as well. How did you make that decision to ultimately play the Isle of Man? Well, in the agreement for the Grand Swiss, which I signed before qualifying for the candidates, it says that qualifying for the candidates, literal wording, qualifying for the candidates by another method is not um, an um justifiable um or I, I forget if they use justifiable or some mm -hmm, other word mm -hmm. but it is not an adequate response uh, not an adequate reason to skip the grand swiss that's what it says got it so it's a of contractual course, I can decision make excuse. i could have always said said told them you know i'm sick like two days before or something right uh but i i didn't want to do that i thought okay i'll play anyway well, you know it's good to get some practice and it's not a bad tournament um generally speaking i think that it shouldn't even be allowed that someone who's qualified plays because there are situations where uh, where this interferes. One very clear one is uh, 
for example, in the World Cup, right? Yeah, with Magnus. I, I wouldn't say Magnus because uh, he technically hasn't qualified for the candidates. But Jan, uh, Nepomniash, uh, Jan Nepomniashi has, has qualified for the candidates um, because he was the, he played the last match. So there are some instances where players uh, who have already qualified go into a qualification tournament. Now, I don't really think that uh, it's going to be a big issue if that happens, but I still think it's better just not to have anyone who's already qualified in the tournament. Interesting. And that's been my opinion for years, but for many years we've already had this. Magnus has played when he was the world champion, uh, the World Cup in 2017, uh, the World Cup in 2021, he was the world champion. I played the Grand Swiss in 2019 when I was already qualified for candidates, and so on and so forth. So FIDE doesn't care too much about it, in fact, they want people to play their tournaments. Yep. That's the reason why I played. I, I do kind of feel like it wasn't a good thing to play because um, I don't think it was a bad thing, but yeah, it was very close to the US Championship and uh, the travel was difficult. So I ended up being like in, in pretty bad physical shape during the tournament, unfortunately. Yep. And I can't say for sure that that negatively impacted me, but, um, but I do have a feeling that it did in the end that... Um, but it I was a contractual time. one, and and you didn't want to, um, to fight it basically, um, or to just like bullshit your way out of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I probably could have done that. I could have either um, convinced them to withdraw me. I think the reason why they have this very clear stipulation in the contract is because, it two years ago, Anish Giri was pretty much a shoe in by rating qualification. And wait, was it two years ago? No, it was probably more than that. It was probably, it was probably four years ago. I mean, I, I think I'm getting the wrong cycle. I think it was 2019. Might be, yes. He had, he had more or less qualified by another method, and then he didn't want to risk his rating. I think this was the like average rating that he was. Yep, I remember um, that. So he withdrew from the Grand Swiss, and it was a little bit of a, not a big controversy, but a minor controversy. I, I think PJ didn't like it very much, and they created this. Um, stipulation basically as a response to that that's my feeling so so yeah I, I i didn't care too much because i don't mind playing like i i, I enjoy playing tournaments but the tournament was difficult normally I, I kind of enjoy playing nile of man i've played there before but the travel was more difficult than i remembered it um the yeah it, it was just ended up being kind of i i didn't go there with a the coach mm -hmm. so i was kind of alone mm -hmm. which is always a bit more difficult mm -hmm. uh, if not um because like let's say having a coach doesn't mean that you're going to all your openings are going to go perfectly but it's good to have uh some company and to, somebody that helps you with the opening preparation but also yeah it takes a load off of it as well yeah even more is you have somebody to discuss with after before the game you have like a psychological helper i guess how, how do you view a coach a second during competition how do, how how do you view them do you view them as friends do you view, and that comes a bit funny coming from me because i've been your second a few times but how do you view uh, your seconds during competition yeah uh well we worked together since 2018 uh for the match and also this year as well for for norway chess right yeah uh and yeah, the way I see it is, of course, you should be on good terms with who you're working with. So you shouldn't have, I think that goes without saying, right? You don't have to be best friends in the world, uh, you know, but um, but generally speaking, the better the relationship, the the better the yeah, the working environment. Right. So, of course, you don't want someone you dislike and uh, and yeah, you want someone who you're generally friendly with. And that's the first thing. Then, uh, of course, you want someone who uh can provide valuable opening work. Uh, that's important. And I think it's also important because, um, like, let's say someone's not experienced in, in the role, then they they might not know what they're doing, and it ends up being a little bit of a... Like, you don't want to have to guide someone through a process, right? Right. You don't want to have to guide someone through the process, so, of course, you're not expecting miracles. Like, nobody can create novelties every game or something. You're, you're not going to, like, win every game out of the opening because you work with someone. That's not the goal, but you also don't want them to not know what they're doing. So you kind of have to um, have to like hold their hand through everything. That's that's obviously not ideal either. Right. 
So uh, because that takes away from your energy, your focus on 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 the games, on the matches itself. Yeah, generally speaking, someone who uh, also if, if they're just like generally positive and they're kind of uh, put you in a good mood, you know, some psychological um, stuff. They if they know how to react to losses, like there's a lot of different things that um, that are quite important. So when it comes to a run of the mill tournament, yeah, you can you don't need to like find the perfect um, second for you. But when it comes to really important tournaments, then you do want to have a team around you that will help but also won't hurt which is important because you can have people can also um if they don't know what they're doing or they're not you know there's not a good chemistry yep then it can also uh take away from your results you know no i i mean i completely understand uh, even as a coach i understand that um coaching a team let's say um if i don't have the right pieces around the team that can even one wrong piece can affect the whole chemistry of the team uh and that's obviously problematic and um it's also tournament by tournament as you just mentioned it depends very much on the pressure on the level of pressure um on the results as well how people deal with certain results and that could also mean how people deal with um victories not only losses obviously losses are always the more difficult thing uh, to deal with, the more difficult uh, process to to deal with. But even with victories, it's um, there's a different makeup uh, to 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 deal with that as well. So yeah, a lot of a lot of details are very important. Cool. Yeah. For um, sure. And obviously that impacted you as well, um, not having somebody uh, there with you. Um, and you just mentioned the traveling was a little bit tricky as well. But I have to say, you you were playing good chess. And what I mean by good chess is, okay, maybe even in some cases you weren't getting the positions that you wanted. I'm thinking about the Bakro game. But you still pushed through. Uh, and Bakro was having an amazing tournament up to that point. He was really playing good quality chess. But even out of, let's say, a position that... Uh, uh didn't look much better for you objectively it was close to equal maybe even slightly worse at one point in the game but you managed to turn it around you managed to actually create chances out of thin air so i think those are good signs in general how are you feeling at that point in in the competition after that game against bakra yeah that was that was the last game i felt kind of good about um I mean, I, it wasn't a great game because I got a nice advantage out of the opening. Then I got a winning position. It wasn't easy. It was winning. But, uh, I didn't realize that. At some point, I saw someone I was objectively winning. Then I spoiled it, and it went, as you said, to an e completely equal position. And I was still pushing because I understood I'm I'm the only one who can potentially play for a win in this position. And then he gave me some small chances. I actually am quite proud of how I took. The chance that he gave me because it was a very small chance it was like the thinnest slice of possibility that I was yes winning. and so yeah I, I i kind of felt that moment very well uh, i evaluated it correctly that of course i'm not better like this but he starts to have to solve some unpleasant issues from a position where of course he felt like it's just in equality and just a draw and so on so uh, and then we we had a weird um sort of transition into the next game because it turned into an, a morning game. Yes, yes. And that was because of uh, there was like a fireworks show, and they didn't want the round to uh, in, to uh, coincide with the fireworks, so they wanted to end the round before that. So we started at eleven thirty. I got the white pieces. I think this like something just went wrong here. Like I got the white pieces and no time to prepare and no energy to prepare. So I basically didn't prepare. I guess uh, that. I got, yeah, and then like my. I just uh, got a terrible position. I played a very risky line. I, of course, it was like a, a combination of bad decisions and bad, um, uh, some bad circumstances. Yeah. Should we so go through uh, through that? Um, do you want to tell us some specifics, specific uh, specific moments? I I don't think that there was so much. Uh, I I can just mention. Let me get the game up. Yeah, I have the game up, so you can uh, you can take me through it. Um. Yeah, okay, let me also get it up. I mean, I remember the game, but... Uh... So... You played b this bishop g5 line, which is obviously extremely aggressive. Yeah, this is this is one of the most um, 
chaotic lines in chess. So I, <laughs> I, I play this line, which is kind of very risky for both sides. Um, and I played it without really much, like I, I know the line well, but I, but to play this line, you kind of have to have checked it very recently. And I didn't. So, um, and the problem was also that he did, and he played a line which he hadn't played before. I mean, earlier in the tournament against Karbov, he played for, instead of g5, bishop e6. So I kind of naively thought, okay, maybe he'll be surprised by my choice, and maybe he'll uh, repeat what he did against Karbov. Mm -hmm. Which is, after bishop e6, it's a rather safe position for white. Right. It's a tiniest bit better, not much, but rather safe position. So that's what I wanted. Instead, he went for the most aggressive line. He maneuvers his knight to g6. Yep. Uh, I played a rare line, which was played, I think, by Gukash with bishop d5. And he played queen d8, which... Um, now, a strong engine will show after knight e3 that h5 is 0, 0.00. Queen f6 is 0, 0.00. Um, uh, other moves also, like everything. It's bishop d7. Everything is the same evaluation. Queen f6 is also 0. 0.0. That's, uh, that's yeah, quite yeah, funny. Yeah. Because Every, everything is equal. I see the chess.com uh, bar. Uh, cries after queen f6 white is much better plus 0 0.9 um this this computer is too weak to understand the position like it really doesn't understand yeah um queen f6 d4 g4 i think like something like this uh even this which i think is not good for, it also leads to equality that's crazy um queen f6 d4 what what else is like a lot of moves i think are leading to Castle, equality here maybe i think, I think h5 queen h5. f6 d4 h5 mm -hmm. Bishop c6, uh, bc, queen a4, mm -hmm. uh, bishop d7, de, de, rook a d1. I don't think knight c4 is a good move. Rook a d1, h4, rook d7, king d7. Okay, I'm just like showing some like random random line that I prepared. Mm -hmm. And okay, eventually it's a, it's a draw. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so basically I didn't have a clear memory of the, the position to, because there's so many moves for black. So... I kind of knew uh, some things. I remembered some things. Like I remembered what to do after h5. I remembered what to do after queen f6. But queen d8 was the move which um, I was really hoping not to see. And he played it <laughs> relatively quickly, so he knew the line because queen d8 is a pretty nonsensical move if you haven't analyzed the position. Like you, you just lose two tempi. Yeah. Moving back to the starting square, right? Yeah. The point is, you want to avoid knight f5. And in contrast with queen f6, d4 does not create the threat of like d takes c5, right? So it allows g4 stuff. Yeah. Uh, so th this is basically the point. Anyway, after queen d8, I started to think because I couldn't remember what to do. Yeah. I remembered that in some order, there were moves like h3, d4, queen b3, and a4. And I couldn't remember in which order. So I played h3, which is fine. h5, queen b3, castle. Also, rook h7 is a very sharp move, castle. And here I'm... Uh, calculated a few things and I was a bit confused so I played a4 yeah now I think the correct move is something like rook, either knight f5 or rook to e1 something like that is correct mm -hmm. uh, which leads again to a complete mess of a position it's not like white is better black's not better after a4 black is much better g4 take take knight h2 queen g5 b5 and I kind of misevaluated this position I thought that after b5 it would be possible to Play this, it turns out after b5, knight f4 is nearly crushing white on the spot. So very luckily, he didn't go for this. Yeah. Did you uh, spot knight f4 during the game? I didn't think it was a problem. I don't know. I calculated something. It didn't seem like an issue. Like, it was it was a bit too complicated for me. Yeah. And for, for him, him as well, obviously. Uh, yeah, after knight a5, I played an excellent move, uh, queen c2, which, like, even chess.com doesn't understand. But strong engine will show queen c2 as the best move. Yeah. To go into this end game, And I was analyzing live... Uh, this position as well and yeah queen c2 from a practical perspective giving up a pawn and going into this end game it felt like a very very good decision but but objectively as well it's an equal position after rook takes f2 yeah the end game is uh if you turn on a very strong engine is an equal evaluation that's how that's how i felt as well live during during the game um like 97 i think b6 is an important move I, there's something like this it's a bit crazy but uh, somehow it's equal yeah and okay, the way he played, I, I didn't actually have any issues. Like, it was relatively easy to play, and I even had like a pretty big time advantage and drew very comfortably. Yeah, at but some I point, I actually me. thought that you were getting some winning chances, but he pulled the brakes in time. Yeah, I, I also thought like, at some point we reach a position, 
where if he wants to get ambitious, it could get double edged. After the, the he takes c5, it, yeah? Or um no, I, I thought like after rook b3, like he can get ambitious with rook a4, and then it turns into a bit of a mess. Yeah. I thought rook a4 was actually the most like ambitious move for him. Yeah. Knight of five, take, take, knight of four. I I understand why he didn't want to go for this. Because it uh it can be good for black, it can also turn into potentially risky for black with the knight on d8, so I understand. Yeah. But anyway, this uh, okay, the the final result of course considering the danger I was in was a good result. But overall, it basically kind of killed my winning chances in the tournament this game because, uh, you know, I I might have two blacks in the last two games but I'll, or I might have a black and a white, but someone's going on plus five at the very least and uh, my tie breaks aren't good. So even if I have a dream finish, which is like, let's say, a draw against Hikaru and then I win some other game, Plus five. Even that might not be enough. Yeah. It probably wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, as we saw, it would definitely wouldn't, but I could already feel like it probably wouldn't. So, uh, overall, and then my energy, like, I, I also couldn't prepare for Ikaru. I kind of didn't, didn't even prepare for that game. I just didn't have energy to prepare anymore. Mm. I'm not sure I would have ex been able to predict <laughs> what he prepared, but, uh, and then somehow yeah, I thought that was, to uh, the last game. So. That was the four knights, yeah, with with uh, with with the d four bishop before and this. Yeah, it's like it's a drawing variation. I, I don't know his exact intentions. I think he wanted basically to have the safest possible position. Yeah. And to check it a little bit, some lines where he can kind of try to push the slightest, slightest bit, but um, but basically, uh, it is an equal, like it it is a variation where it kind of turns into equality with. Uh, some care from the black side. Where did things go wrong in, 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 in that game? Okay, bishop c3, bad decision, queen e7. If I play queen e7, I think 99% the game ends in a draw very Got quickly. It. Got it. Because queen e7, there's even been many games like this. White plays bishop g5, black plays um, c... No, wait, how does black play after bishop g5? I think black plays h6. Mm -hmm. Knight d5, there's like games... Ah, yeah. With bishop, bishop d5, d5 bishop, bishop f6... Six. Bishop f3, bishop e7, bishop d1, bishop f8, <laughs> bishop c2, bishop c5, bishop c5, <laughs> bishop c2, rook d8. And this is a, a position where white really doesn't have much hope to win because okay, extra pawn, but obvious colored bishops in a very simplified position, and black doesn't really have weaknesses. Um, I think this is what Hikaru was sort of going for because the draw was not a bad result for him. Mm. It was just he didn't, he shouldn't lose the game. That's the main thing. He, he really shouldn't lose the game. Yeah. So, bishop c3 first moment. Uh, okay, queen g3, king h8 is fine, a4. Did you want to keep can... chances to potentially play for a win? Was that kind of the thought no, behind no, it? No, I mean, you can't. In this position, you can't play for a win with black. It's slightly worse for black everywhere. I mean, it's equal, but it's it's like black has to prove it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just thought that after king h8, it should be fine. But I kind of underestimated that after a4, my queen is very bad. So, okay, he mentioned out to the game queen a6 instead of rook e8, which I didn't want to play because I thought bishop e7, and then he starts to maybe uh, corral that pawn on c5. I wasn't sure. But, okay, rook e8 is not a bad move. Rook d6. h6 is actually a terrible move. And after I played it, I realized, like, what, what did I just do to my position? Mm. It's kind of shocking, but h6 is more or less a losing move. Mm. I need to play some move like rook ac8, and then I suffer, but with a draw, still a more likely result. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Six bishop four. I was like, I'm just losing. How did it, how did I make this move after he played bishop four? I was like, I wanted to play rook a d eight. This was my idea with h six. Ah, uh, this was this... bishop e five and rook takes e six, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. This is this is the reason, and because I thought rook e six, f e six, bishop c seven, queen a six would be kind of equal, and rook c six. I okay. I kind of also blunder here. I thought e three would work, which it doesn't. Uh, so obviously my, I thought rook c6, e3, queen e3, but then bishop d5 or bishop d7, he has queen c5, so obviously I'm I'm stupid. <laughs> no. um, but then, like, what do I do after bishop f4? Because very often, like, one of my moves after bishop f4 I wanted to play was... Um, f6 was maybe? Rook, no, 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 rook no, a c8. You allow queen... 
Queen G6. Like rook times. AC8, I thought, okay, I stop rook C6. He still has to prove how to like win this position. And then I thought that after bishop B5, F6, he plays rook B1. Mm -hmm. And no, no, wait, it wasn't rook C8. What was the move? I'm trying to. Oh no, king H7. Aha. Uh -huh. King H7. Because I, I thought, okay, I'm kind of trying to consolidate. Like rook C6, he can play. But after rook C6, I can bring my queen back or I can play C4 and it's not the end of the world. Yeah. But then I realized king h7, bishop b5, f6, rook b1. It's like, it's the only way to cleanly win, but after this I just resign. I mean, uh, it's like how how weak my king is, is is kind of surprising. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I played rook e7, which looks bizarre, but I just wanted to stop any tactics with rook b1. Queen e3, uh, then I blundered, of course, I should play rook a to e8. And I still think it's not at all easy for white to prove. Uh, a win here or anything it's like it's a massively unpleasant position but but it does feel like his task is easier than yours i guess uh if you want to compare it like that like your task to find the best defensive moves is more difficult than him to to prove his advantage yeah the thing is it can't really go wrong for him like worst case he only wins a pawn <laughs> and right. then he still presses for a long for a long time best case i just blunder like i did and yeah. Okay, turns out bishop h6 is actually a mistake, but I um I didn't even realize bishop e5 was just so crushing. Like f6, bishop f6, gf6, queen h6, king g8. Mm -hmm. Uh and here like rook ad I didn't realize this was winning. Rook ad1. Rook ce8. I guess queen the G6. idea is rook takes e6 and rook d7, yeah. That's the Yeah, at some point that. he has rook d5. Like I play rook e8 at some point he plays rook d5. I didn't realize this was winning. So Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe this is not easy to find bishop h6. Of course, I have to play rook d7, but this is such a nightmare because now I'm actually down a kingside pawn. Yeah. Losing the c pawn is, is one thing, but losing a kingside pawn, my king is always weak now. Yeah. And uh, yeah, after f6, uh, I mean, it's he, he, he converted it well, but it did feel like white has kind of an abundance of uh, options, and one of them will work out somehow. Yeah, yeah. No, so that was really gonna that was that was definitely a painful, uh, painful loss. Not necessarily. I mean, obviously the result is is painful, but also the way it happened, you never got uh, a lot of chances out of out of the opening, basically. Um, yeah, I just like got killed from the opening. It was very um, unexpected. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. All right, let's get back. And obviously, the last one against Kaimer. That was an interesting opening. Um, that uh, that means yeah, also so. I, like didn't didn't play very well. Uh, I, mean, I made this bad decision. Knight h4 should play. Of course, knight d2. I was like thinking, do I want to play knight h4? Force matters, or do I want to play knight d2? Keep it. Like I I I knew I was better after knight d2. Uh huh. This I I, I just kind of knew. Um, so it was because... some sort of a preparation. Yeah. No, no, I just knew that like this is what I'm aiming for. King h8. Of course, I never prepare with like king h8 because it's a no offense, but it's a ridiculous move. It makes no sense. Right. Um, it just doesn't serve any purpose. It's basically like a pass. It's like if you played, you know, a6 or something. But a6 maybe would be more useful. Um, so a king h8 is a pure passing move. It just there's no purpose to it. And I could have punished immediately with knight e1, but okay, uh, this is maybe not 100% obvious. E3 is not a bad move. Queen e7. And the thing is, I knew that in this position. If I play knight d2 and he's forced to take on g2, then I have an advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I knew this kind of generally. Um, after h6, I always play bishop h4, and he's left with a pin which he can only break by playing g5. Yeah. Which means that his king side will get weakened. Mm -hmm. You go. Then I thought, okay, knight h4, even more um, challenging for him, h6, and I thought bishop e4, hg5, knight f5. And then when I actually got to this position after h6, I started to be less sure about the position after knight f5, which I really should have gone for. So it was just like a, a series of, of uh, bad decisions. Yeah. The reason I didn't go for this is because after knight f5, I thought, oh, he has this very clever queen e6. He provokes d5, and then he goes back to e8. So he tries to close the center. And it turns out that this is probably not very good for black. and. He wasn't going to play it anyway, so I should have just gone for this quickly and then made him suffer. Yeah. Instead of making myself suffer, and 
like I, I'm the one for some reason I'm laboring over decisions that he has to make. I said I should just go for this and then he'll probably play queen d7. I'll play bishop g2. I, it's not like I win the game or anything, but okay, I, I definitely have a pleasant advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the game, I just got nothing. He played well, uh, but the position was actually not that risky for him. So yeah, he, he defended wasn't really well. Under pressure. He defended well. Um, yeah, then that concludes your uh, tournament. Rating-wise, minus one. Obviously not something that you wanted, but not a complete disaster by any stretch of the imagination. Still maintaining that uh, second rating spot in the live ratings. Uh, let's talk winners and losers after this one, because as you mentioned, there are so many things that got clarified after the tournament. Um, two candidate spots. Obviously, the winners from that perspective are um, Vidit and Hikaru. I mean, uh, Vidit, absolutely ridiculous um, turn of events after he lost the first round against Lamy. And then I believe he scored, yeah, plus six after losing the first game. is absolutely no, no, he bonkers. scored plus seven. He was plus six total. Right, right, right. Right, plus six uh, total. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. what I mean. Um, to win seven games after that <laughs> in ten games is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, but it was kind of incredible. I mean, he drew uh, Nair, he drew Hikaru, and he drew Yasupenko, and he beat Gupta, uh, Kolars, Shirov, Hans. Yeah, uh, Sindarov, uh, Dayak, and finally. Predke. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Vidit was uh, obviously pretty brilliant. I mean, nothing more to say. Okay, he's a clear winner of the tournament, and he deserved it. Yeah. Yeah. And he absolutely probably is the other winner. I mean, not he's not the tournament winner, but from the point of view of who had a good tournament, he is obviously a winner in this tournament. Yeah. Yeah, and Hikaru well, kind five, of had two outs, right, five. from from this one. He had the uh, rating out, and it was this race, this very close race, because they both came into the event, Ali Reza and uh, Hikaru 27-77, I think it was, separated by 0. 0.6 points, and they were obviously ahead of everybody else in terms of rating, so they could uh, be vying for that rating spot for the candidates, but also for uh, the top two. Obviously, he qualified out of the top two, so... Um, he gets the candidate spot by rating also wins a bunch of rating but it's not as consequential um, what about Firuja? Firuja definitely did not have a good event um, I would I would put no, him no, I, I think that he would be in the losers category here because yeah. although maybe on paper you could say that it makes him the front runner in the rating spot he, he lost 14 points his rating spot is not as not guaranteed. As before. Not guaranteed, right? Yeah. I'm okay. He has a, a nine point lead. I think it's a pretty significant lead. But over who? Over Anish. But I wouldn't even call him and and Anish necessarily his his biggest threat. Obviously, he's happy that Hikaru made it by uh, by the Grand Swiss. Now he's in pole position. But at the same time. Um, Anish is probably going to make it by GP points, Grand Prix points. But which one gets precedence? Like, let's say Anish gets both the rating spot and the FIDE circuit spot. That's a good question. That is a very so, good question. I, I would guess that probably the FIDE circuit spot takes precedence, which means that Ali Reza is like, then he's kind of guaranteed, unless Wesley somehow makes up 11 points, which the only way that would happen is probably if Ali Reza has a bad tournament. They're both playing in 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 the Singfield Cup. Yeah, yeah, we're talking about the Singfield Cup. So let's say how could how could Wesley pass Ali Reza? Wesley scores like, plus Wesley two. Wesley scores plus two, and Ali Reza scores minus fifty percent. Minus no. one would fifty percent. Fifty percent will not cut it, will it? Maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah, yeah. You might be right. I'm. Hmm. Let me think. So Wesley plus two, he will gain more than ten points. It might also be. Um, yeah, it might also actually cut it. I think it's he's higher rated than the average, right? He's going to be higher uh, rated than the average. Ali Reza, because his, his last tournament is not coming in, so he still keeps his rating of 2780 or so. Right? Yeah. And Wesley is 2752, so he's below the average probably. Yes. So, yeah, 
you, when you put it like that, it's not too impossible. I mean, Wesley scoring plus two, it's happened before. Ali Reza scoring fifty <laughs> percent. He always scores actually plus two. actually fine with his rating, though. I mean, so yeah. It just ha you you don't even have to have one person having a bad tournament. You just have to have one person overperforming slightly. Now, um, yeah, again, this is not uh, something I think about too much because I, I don't it doesn't really affect me too much, right? I'm not the one fighting for the rating spot, but Ali Reza definitely, if he wanted the let's say the Grand Swiss, hey, let's say he's happy about uh, Hikaru qualifying. The other thing that was important to him was to not lose much rating, and he didn't. Mm -hmm. He did not fulfill that part. He how, lost fourteen points. That's how 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 uh, what what do you think is happening with Ali Reza? Obviously, um, huge uh, huge boost, uh, huge prospect, uh, ridiculous twenty eight hundred at. 18 years of age um and i think that's when um he played that incredible european team championship tpr of over over uh, 3000 and then slowly slowly he's continued fading with the exception obviously of the same field cup last year which uh, once again was an incredible result but i was looking there was this graphic on reddit and it was showing visually how he slowly slowly declined in terms of performance uh but what strikes me even more odd is that he's not playing a lot of events. I mean, we knew that, but still, to see it visually uh, represented like that, he's just simply not playing a lot of events. Since the Sinfield Cup, he played three classical events. The Super Bet in Romania, uh, Norway Chess, and, and the Grand Swiss. Super Bet in Romania, I see 27.97, good rating performance, obviously. Norway Chess, 27.08. Grand Swiss twenty six seventy eight, obviously losing fourteen rating points. How 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 do you see him? How how do you feel him? His presence, his 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 stamina, his confidence, because you've been around him um, for the past eleven days or so. Okay, I don't. I mean, I'm not going to speak too much about one tournament. I mean, okay, the Reddit people they like to uh, draw conclusions from one tournament or right. one game very often, right? Uh, right. Magnus loses a game. <laughs> washed washed up. <laughs> No, okay, I, I don't, of course he's had a bad tournament, I, I don't know. Um, that he doesn't play much is obviously his preference for some reason. I, it's not not how I approach things. Not what I would recommend to him, as if I was his coach or something, right? I wouldn't say play two, three classical tournaments a year, I would say play more. On the other hand, I mean, he's still 20, he's 27. He's only 20, something. yeah, he's only 20, it's yeah, ridiculous. It's not, I mean, there's not much really to. He he's obviously an excellent player. Yeah, he he's ha had two bad tournaments in a row, classical tournaments. So that's uh, that's obviously not something he's going to be happy about. I don't know. I don't have an insight into his training, into his motivation. I don't know. Nobody in does. Terms of his, his, well, I, maybe someone does, but I I I'm not that person. In terms of him as a player, like I've always had good results against him, so. I don't want to say, um, I don't want to speak too much about that because it's going to bias my opinion. Like, yeah, last time we played, I beat him with the black pieces from, uh, like, without much difficulty. And last time I played Hikaru, he beat me without much difficulty, right? So some individual games will taint your opinion of a player. Uh, like, maybe Hikaru thinks, uh, like, I'm a piece of shit because of the last <laughs> game. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that Ali Rez is, uh, you know, not playing well because of our life. Okay, it's it's one, it's very singular games. So, uh, so I'm not going to read too much into that. Into that, but yeah, definitely he's he's been struggling. His quality of play was not very good uh, in the last tournament. Uh, I don't know the reason why, but still, it's like, I mean, look at look at Jan. Uh, he. He had that uh, candidate's win in 2020, 2021. Then he lost the match horribly against Magnus. Then he had a very bad super bet tournament. And everyone's saying, okay, he's, the guy's finished, of course. And then he wins the candidates with plus five or whatever. And he plays another match. So um, it, it's really not about a single game or a single tournament. Like we can speak about this in. Uh, maybe in another year, like if he has a bad year, then okay, then we'll talk, right? Yeah, yeah. If he if he suddenly wins the Sinkfield Cup, we probably will forget all about uh, him 
having a bad Grand Swiss and so on. Yeah, guaranteed. So I, I think that that's basically it. That's also the way I see a lot of these players because uh, I also include myself. I mean, all players. Gukesh, he was on a very hot streak. Now he's lost a ton of rating in his last two events. Um, but suddenly, you know, Prague is uh, um, the, let's say, clear kind of front runner of the very young guys. Yep. Uh, but then Vidit suddenly came comes out of uh, nowhere and he's gained 22 points and he's number 16 in the world and he's um, the same rating as Richie and he's ahead of Shakriar and Grishuk and Duda and so on, Maxime. Uh, so, you know, this is very much an up and down thing. It's really about long term, not just one tournament. Um, um, like, we always revisit, you know, the predictions that we made. Consistency. The young Indian guys, right? And mm-hmm. it was like, okay, Gukesh is now the, the number one and it's very clear. And now suddenly it's not clear anymore. Prague is 2740. Arjun is 2727. Gukesh is 2719. Um, and uh, probably forgetting someone. Um, I mean, besides, like the very young guys, obviously, but it is twenty-seven, thirty-seven. Um, yeah. So he's, you know, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to say too much. Yeah. And speaking of uh, like, recency uh, bias, um, you did mention Eric Aisi. He's been having a pretty decent um, couple of events. Obviously, Qatar Masters. He did well up up until the final round when he gave up a rook in one move. And I saw that as <laughs> that, that that was yeah uh, disgusting. Um, I would have puked uh, over the board at that point if if I would have played rook h4. And I mean that's not an easy thing to just brush off your shoulders immediately. You know it, it haunts you for a long time. But then he managed to turn it around and and really didn't show any scars in um, Isle of Men. He played a fantastic event. He was in contention up until the final round. So Eric Aisi definitely showing a lot of grit and yeah, definitely he has showing that he's good. I mean, he's a good player. Like, so is Kaimer. Great player, right? yeah. Kaimer yeah. also, are, yeah, that's a good point. They're both very good players. They're they're young young guys. I mean, they're going to be going up and down for a while probably. At some point, they might settle into a role in the top 10 or whatever they're level turns out to be we we can't really say it's uh i mean we can say for like the for magnus for me for ikaru like we understand uh kind of what our careers have i mean we can't say for sure what's going to happen in the future but more or less what our careers have turned into we can say right uh for the young guys it's still too early to say because if we imagine that um let's say uh, Gukesh, that he never breaks 2750 again, uh, then probably all this, uh, all the like promise that uh, that he was, I mean, obviously 27 like 50 plus player, 2760 at at 16, you know, you think future world champion, and it may be the case. I'm not trying to say it's not, but uh, but that you have to have that consistency until you actually become world champion. It's not like you become 2760 and you're world champion. So it's um, and and some player who maybe has a slower progress, like okay, Arjun is an example, but there could be other examples. I I, I can't think of anyone off the top of my <laughs> head, but maybe someone like Nihal, who yeah. isn't twenty seven hundred yet, right? Yeah. Um, or or maybe someone else who we don't even know as well, but someday could become uh, a, a like for example, Levon is a good example, uh, good example of someone who kind of progressed late bloomer, late, I guess, yeah, but became very close to world champion and number two in the world for many years and one of the best players um not only of his generation but uh, in history and so on so there's um there's definitely a lot of things that can happen for all players it's not it's not like you become 2750 and you're you're set for life you know it's it's a process it's it's a consistency uh that's required for sure to stay at the top um and I think you, you you made a good point at some uh, at some particular moment in that event. You mentioned uh, Sindarov. I think after you played him, what's your opinion on uh, him? Plus twenty in this one, obviously having a fantastic couple of uh, months. Right now, twenty seven oh one in the live rating list. Seventeen years of age. What's your what's your take on Sindarov? Yeah, no, he's he's very good. But again, it's it's a bit too early to say. I mean, when I played him, he seems to to 
okay, it's just one game, right? But yeah. he seems to be a very good player. Um, now, what will happen in the future? I have no idea, but he'll probably be a... Um, at some point, I said he'll probably break 2750. I, I think that would be a relatively safe bet to make. Hmm. Like, I, I would feel relatively comfortable making that bet, um, but I can't guarantee that. Yeah. And uh, it's... Oh, well, it's a lot of tough competition, but it's always like that, right? I mean... I mentioned at some point that like my generation is uh, the strongest ever. I don't, okay, I, people always argued about that. Actually, I wanted like a small bone to pick because <laughs> when I said like my generation is the strongest ever, I was talking about the generation from like let's say 1987 to 1993. I don't know, like a very small window of time which includes players like Hikaru and 93 is like Wesley, maybe 94, we can count Anish and so on, you know? Um, and then people were like, well, there was that generation, you know, that had uh, Bodvinik and Karpov. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> well, like 50 years apart in age. I mean, that's like saying I'm the same generation as Korshnoi. I mean, uh, like, you know, okay, not 50 years apart. I think Bodvinik was probably born in like, uh, <laughs> Karpov was born in 51. I know that. Uh, when was Bodvinik born? I think I think he was like born in the let's see, early 1910s. Uh, uh, I could be wrong. I'll, 1911. I'll tell you. In 1911. 1911. Very nice. Yeah, it's like it's a 40-year nice. spread. I mean, you you can't <laughs> say. And then people were like, "How can you call your generation the strongest?" I'm like, "You don't even understand what a generation is. I mean, you're you're counting players who are 40 years apart." Yeah, like basically. Levon is not in your generation. You don't consider Levon in your generation. 1983. I, uh, he's he's born in 83, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, we we have played so much that maybe it's fair to say, but I wouldn't say, the, and I don't think he would say that either, that we're part of the same generation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 10 years apart, uh, nearly. So, but it, but calling Karpov and Bodvinik the same generation is like saying that I'm the same generation as Korshnoi or Karpov because I, I played both of them. Uh, I also played Gary, right? We're not the same generation. <laughs> uh, like uh, for me, the the let's say look at let's look at the current top ten: Magnus, me, Hikaru, Ding, Nepo. Uh, I would say we're all the same generation. Giri, Wesley, all same generation. Karyakin, all same generation. Mm -hmm. And then the outliers are Ali Reza. He's mm -hmm. the new generation and Vichy he is the previous mm -hmm. generation Vichy's generation is like uh Kramnik who is actually I think significantly younger than Vichy so maybe but let's say Kramnik Gelfand um uh, Ivanchuk um uh okay now I'm gonna like blank on on millions of people but uh <laughs> but uh basically this this generation of players he's an outlier for and, sure uh Topalov and so on and so on so and and then we have like the middle generation, which is like Lenier, um, Rajabov, Levon. Uh, I'm just going down the rating list now. Um, Shakriar, um, Grishuk, uh, Oronian, and uh, I'm probably forgetting some people as well. Ponomaryov, um, I don't know, Rustam, uh, maybe Rustam also is in that generation. You know, the, like, we can argue about this, but uh, about what what would count. But um, anyway, I think it's clear that people had kind of a misconception about what we're talking about. But yeah, the reason I said that my generation is the strongest is because okay, it had Magnus, who was world champion for a very long time. Um, I played a world championship match. Ding, I think when I said it, he wasn't world champion, or maybe he was. I forget when I said this, but um, he is world champion now. Kayakin played a world championship match. Jan played two world championship matches. Uh, Anish Wesley, and uh, like you can just keep naming people. Maxime, uh, it's like so many players in my generation were 2800. If you look at the 2800 list, Carlson, me, Wesley, Maxime, Hikaru, Ding, um, Anish, Nepo. Okay, Nepo was like 0. 0.2 points away from 2800, but. Uh, like half the 2800 players are players uh from the 90s or late 80s yeah um and then the other players are like okay gary of course and vishy and topolo um wait yeah topolo topolo is 48 yeah yeah and i think 20, he was 2800 20, right 
No, he was a, he was over 2800 for a long time. Yeah. I think people forget how because he kind of disappeared. He was very strong, very dominant, scene. very dominant. How how far over 2800 he was for so many years. Um anyway. Yeah. That's just my little rant. Very nice rant. I hope uh yeah, we should pick rants with with Reddit and commenters every single week. I think it's a good segment. Um <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll ask you a a question about uh, Magnus because he's still listed as one of uh, the candidates right now. He's still not out of uh, the official equation. Um, what are the chances percentage-wise that he plays the candidates? Uh, so... 0. Point what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like it's nothing. I mean, he he has said that he will not play the candidates uh he would be by saying this i mean it would almost be an ethical issue if he played because he's both giving someone hope and also interfering with people's potential preparation and also the fact that he played a tournament the world cup qualified said he wouldn't play during the tournament which messes up what people might be doing right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then actually as a playing would be like very shaky ethical grounds i think and I don't think he would want to do that. Yeah. Uh, and the system is not changing, like the the format, right? He said that he wants faster time controls or change in format or something. The candidates is going to be its usual 14 rounds, double round robin, eight players, classical time control. So, uh, yeah, I don't. Um, yeah, I, I don't see that changing. Yeah, yeah, uh, me neither. I don't think he's. Uh... He's playing the candidates almost, uh, yeah, zero point whatever, oh, yeah. zero point one percent, zero percent. Yeah, uh, and speaking of uh, the cycle, Ding made an appearance. Um, he, as we sort of predicted, uh, as we anticipated, said that he had and he still has some health issues that he won't play the Singfield Cup, um, which we sort of expected. Uh, he got replaced by Levon. But we'll play uh, Tata Steel, which is kind of funny because I mean, that's one of the most, in terms of logistics, one of the more painful events of the year. You're playing in a, a godforsaken uh, place, not you know, uh, not to shit on on, on Tata Steel <laughs> and the place itself, but uh, it's it's not necessarily a fun place per se to be in. It's cold, it's rainy every single day. It's a long tournament. Um, if you have a bad result, and he did have a pretty terrible result last year, obviously uh, those are going to leave some scars, uh, painful scars. But he seems very willing and very happy to return to that still. Um, so he announced his uh, return. Um, he's not out. He's 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 not retired. <laughs> what do you make of that? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what his health problems are. I obviously haven't um heard anything about that i mean I, I saw that he kind of said something and i saw that he did commentary for an event he's coming for my job yes <laughs> well i have also done commentary but, <laughs> but it, he did commentary for the chinese league which was a bit unusual i guess um yeah i don't know uh i, I mean there's not much to say if he has some health problems i hope he gets through them yeah but i, I don't really know anything else about it yeah yeah, yeah, no, um, definitely will be interesting to see him uh, return and we wish him a speedy recovery, obviously. Um, always uh, better when the world champion is um, is uh, playing tournaments. Rapid and Blitz was just announced. Another hot subject. Obviously, we were speculating um, on camera and off camera as to where and when the world Rapid and Blitz uh, is going to be played. Right now, it seems that the negotiations came to an end and Samar Khan in Uzbekistan um, won the bid. And that's going to happen during the usual dates of uh, yeah. December 26th through the 30th. Christmas dates. I really hate these dates, man. Um, it's, it's just you have to juggle or you have to choose between, okay, do I spend Christmas? And for a lot of people, this matter a lot. Or do I go halfway across the world and, and play the Rapid and Blitz. Um, rough. I know at some point there were discussions that is going to be 
in the second part of January or like maybe the first part of January um, in, in Abu Dhabi, I think there was a discussion at one point. I know Dubai was um, was on the menu. Uh, in the end, it was Uzbekistan. How do you feel about this? Uh, and, and what's your take on this fee they're just announcing every single year? And it's like clockwork. Every single year, they, they wait up until the last moment to announce the dates and, and, and the place. Yeah, it's, it's completely terrible. I mean, there's not much you can say good about this uh, like the the biggest issue i really feel is the uh, location and it's not because i have anything against uh samarkand or uzbekistan and i i do know it's like a historic city um and i think that they're like famous for making carpets yes um, part of the but, uh, silk road but how how do you get to samarkand is the question i've looked it up it's so difficult for an american or for someone um in North America or, or South America. It's just so difficult. I mean, to go from, let's say, Toronto, which is where my event in December is, to Samarkand is a 35-hour trip, and it's prohibitively expensive in terms of flights. Like, economy ticket is, I think, for over four grand. Um, which, like, if you're just thinking about the average person who won't have, who won't have much chance to make money, in the rapid blitz uh because most people go there just for fun because just it's very fun, difficult yeah. to make money there yeah but they, nobody wants to pay you know four or five grand in ticket costs take a 35 hour trip a 10 to 11 hour time difference depending on where you are um it's like it's just so prohibitive for uh for north and south american players and for europeans it's slightly better like let's say you are in Western Europe, you can probably get there in two flights. You can go through Istanbul and then to Samarkand. It's still a, a long trip. It's, it's like about a seven hour hours, trip. seven, eight hours, something like that. Maybe I mean, 10, maybe 10. Totally, yeah. 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 It's, it's still not an easy trip, but, uh, but yeah, it's better if you're a European, but I mean, are we ignoring the fact that like many of the best players in the world come from our continent here? Uh, and, and we're just kind of shut out of it because it's too difficult to get to. It just doesn't make sense for me. Like I'm, I'm thinking about it. Like how, how would this make sense to the time difference from St. Louis is 11 hours. So I, I should probably, unless I want to be completely dead, like sleep, uh, sleep at the chessboard. I should probably arrive there like at least four days before. Yeah. Um, if you're coming not gonna from come North America, yes. Hotel. Yeah. So, um, I'm playing a tournament. Okay. Let's say I have a, a few days break and then I immediately, uh, go, I have like four days rest. Still, that's not enough for an 11 hour time difference. Mm -hmm. uh, my trip is going to be, yes, uh, at, at the very, if I don't get delays or some kind of like missed flights, which very often happen, then a 30 hour trip. So that's a very long trip, um, which means I will arrive there the next day. So I have to leave a day in advance if I, and I'll still be tired. And just physically, it's very difficult being in a plane or being in a series of planes for 30 plus hours. Uh, it's very like, I mean, you know how it is, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, the travel yeah. really takes a lot out of you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you're if you're from um, from Central Asia, it's amazing. <laughs> if you're from Kazakhstan or uh, Georgia or yeah, Central Asia or, or Russia or somewhere like that, uh, the trip is pretty pretty easy. If you're from Turkey, you can probably get there in one flight. Um, if you're from the Middle East. Yeah. But for a large amount of chess players, it's really tough. And the best place would be to have it in Europe because this is more or less a central location where everyone um, doesn't have too much difficulty to get there. Yeah. Or most. Like if it's in Germany or somewhere like that, it doesn't like if it's in Frankfurt, you can probably get from almost any city in the world in one to two flights to Frankfurt. Right. I mean, so. Uh, I, I have no issue with the location. It's just it's so far. It's so difficult to get to. Um, at least like when they were saying maybe Dubai or Abu Dhabi. Okay, it's far, but at least it's a central hub. So uh, going from St. Louis, I can get to Dubai or Abu Dhabi in two flights. And and that's better. At least less chances to miss a flight, less chances to, to um, well, at least I don't have to take three flights. You know? Yeah, yeah. And it it's less it hours, boost. way less hours. I think you can get the buy yeah, like what fifteen just... hours, something like that. Um, and some work on <laughs> thirty hours. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's obviously painful. Um, but that's the situation. And, and if you, 
That, and that's not accounting the money cost because that's a big I problem. About, that's a big issue. Yeah, yes. Like, okay. I, I last time I made around fifty grand, because that that was because I got, um, I got third place. You got the bronze right? medal in blitz, right? Yeah, I think I shared second, third, and I got third in in rapid, not blitz. Rapid. Mm -hmm. And in twenty twenty one, it was the same because I shared first through fourth in rapid. And in Blitz, I made like oh, very little. Um, but the fact that I, I, I had a decent Blitz tournament last time. I think I scored a, like plus something. Decent plus, maybe plus four, plus five. I think I got like 14th place. I probably made a grand from that. Uh, so you can imagine like you have, let's say you go there and you score uh, like plus four in Rapid, plus four in Blitz. You had a very good good result right very you probably good have result. like a 2800 yes. performance yes in both tournaments win like 100 you make, points you will make very little money i don't know if you would cover your travel and uh, the extra hotel days that you would have to stay there do they cover hotel and and travel yeah but not for travel not costs be for the extra days right oh i don't think travel costs i mean do they cover hotel every... for everybody or for probably the top not. 20 players let's say or like the top 50 how, I, how, how many get conditions sure. i know that my hotel was covered last time but I don't know about for everyone else. Okay, um, I, I highly doubt they cover for anybody outside of no, the top ten, unlikely, top twenty. Right? Um, it would be just way too much money for them. So yeah, and especially with travel costs. I mean, they would they would have to like start dumping. <laughs> I can't imagine how much the travel costs would be. No, no, it's it's definitely for most people. They're they're taking a monetary loss to play this tournament. But this and is I, another I read that Hikaru said he won't or he has a very low chance to play. He doesn't so want to play if, either, huh? Wow. If I don't play and Hikaru doesn't play, then half of the top four is... And Ding is not playing. Um, and Ding is like number one in Rapid, right? Yes. Uh, so in Blitz, Hikaru is number three. I'm number four. Uh, so yeah, they'll... Well, I don't know. I don't know about Magnus and Ali Reza. They're the top two. Uh, but you could already see a... a like I don't know about Levon, he might not play. But, you, know, you could see a lot of players who, who um, from the top, who just don't play because of the location, yeah. or because of the difficulty. And uh, yeah, I mean, you you should try to make an event where it's equally easy for everyone to get to, or at least as easy as, as equal as as possible, right? That that's what I think. Yeah. No. And I mean, location is one thing, but. I really despise the dates also. It's just uh, so painful for a lot of the players. I mean, a lot of the players want to be, and I think Navarro was mentioning this in one of his uh, posts. Um, a lot of the players just travel a lot throughout the year, and then they have the holiday season to spend with their families, and that's being stripped away if they want to participate in the World Championship um, tournament. So it, it's painful, and from that perspective, but also from the financial perspective, because any flights around Christmas are going to be ridiculously overpriced. Um, if you do it, let's say, after January 5th, after January 6th, you're going to get completely different results um, financially. So yeah, I, I, I really player. don't Wesley, understand. Right? Hmm? Wesley never plays these things because of the dates. Yeah, yeah, he's... He's very religious yeah. and, and he spends Christmas with his family. So, um, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. And even myself, I will never want to play this tournament just for the simple fact that uh, it's a great tournament to play in and I would love to participate in a World Championship match. But, I mean, Christmas is Christmas is Christmas. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah. yeah. I, also, I also, also always enjoy playing. Like, I had a very good time last time. I went to... Again, it was the location was was not great. I mean, it was Almaty is also a very difficult place to get to. But okay, I, I went to the tournament in Almaty, um, hung out with the chess bras, uh, had a good tournament, <laughs> had a good rapid. It, it was it was a nice event, you know. I had a very good time there. In in Warsaw, I had a very good time as well, uh, even though there was like COVID stuff, so which made it kind of um, like a little bit unpleasant in some ways, but. For example, Hikaru got uh, got sick there, right? He he, he had got to stuck. He got also stuck in in Warsaw. <laughs> Quarantine so, in Warsaw. But I, I really like the tournament. I I really it's one of my favorite tournaments to play in. Um, I was just thinking, like for for the guys for which this is next door, I was like, imagine if they held the Rapid Blitz Championship in Chicago. That would be really nice. 
Now that <laughs> that that's like for for like the Uzbek guys, right? Uh, who maybe live in Tashkent, right? <laughs> it's like this is like if they held it for me in Chicago. I would be so thrilled. I mean, it's such a nice event to play in, but uh, you know, also when you get to like 30 plus, you have to think a little bit about your health and the travel is really brutal. Um, yeah. For, for a tournament, which is not very long, right? So um, it's only, a few, it's only five days long. No, no, it's, it's, um, it's a big responsibility, especially if you go there as one of the favorites, you want to go there and, and perform at your best. Again, you mentioned it. You, you have to go there a week in advance, get acclimated with time zone. Then you basically spend five days and return back to your uh, initial time zone. So, yeah, it's um, f from a lot of perspective, uh, per perspective, a lot of uh, angles. It's uh, it's a difficult one. All right, we ranted about uh, the rapid and Again, you know, I'm looking at like the photos, and it does look like a really nice city. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure it's going to be great. Look, uh, no, it's it's like really only the travel. I mean, the city itself, I, I would uh, I would like to visit. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a, I don't know. Okay. I'll still think about it, but yeah, it's. Um, I, I think it's not looking very likely for me. Mm, mm, yeah, um, and that's that's a huge loss. Cool. All right. Um, <laughs> I think we covered a lot this uh, this week. It's it's good to have you back. There's still a lot of things coming up, but I'm sure we're going to be uh, discussing them in future episodes. We have the Champions Chess Tour, but that's later on. Obviously, the Rapid and Blitz Singfield Cup. I think we're gonna try to squeeze in maybe the, before the Rapid and Blitz starts as well. Um, I guess I'll leave it with this final question. How do you get ready? You mentioned that uh, traveling was was a bit painful. The energy levels were uh, a bit depleted after the Isle of Man. How do you get ready for the Rapid and Blitz? Another sequence of events, Rapid and Blitz and the Singfield Cup coming up in just five days from now. Yeah, I'll probably, um, well, I'll try to get like physically uh, back in shape because uh, I did just play a tournament, so mo main thing is to be kind of fresh. Yeah. And um, yeah, besides that, like rapid prep is a bit different than classical prep, right? It's a bit more, you can test out some creative ideas. Blitz, you don't really prep very much at all because it very rarely comes down to any sort of opening stuff in Blitz. I mean, openings are one of the least important. I still think like you don't want to get terrible positions. At some point, I was playing very bad openings in Blitz, getting punished for it. So you want to avoid this. But generally speaking, Blitz games rarely get decided at the start of a game, right? You usually yeah. get decided in the middle game or uh, in time scrambles. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, it'll be nice because I played a long classical event and then another long classical event after that. And before that, I played um, the World Cup, which was a bit of a mix, but still it was classical chess for the most part. So I haven't played Rapid and Blitz over the board since uh, Zagreb. It'll be nice to get back into it. There, the Rapid went very well for me, but the Blitz was a bit too up and down, and uh, um, and that was kind of the reason why it didn't end so well for me. Mm -hmm. So, but in in Rapid, I did well. I was actually very happy with my Rapid play there. Yeah, like uh, I I think I had tied with Jan, and. He kind of kept it up in the blitz while Magnus ran away with it in blitz, right? You remember Magnus won all those games. Yep, 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 yep. Nine, nine, nine out of nine, I think. So Nepo got place. second place. I got fourth place. Ali Reza had a really strong blitz tournament and he got third place, which was actually very, um, like, not good for my no um, standings in the Grand Chess Tour, but still we're doing all right. So hopefully I'll play well. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, I'm... I have some news actually too. I uh, forgot to uh, to add them, but I will add them right now. I'm going to uh, go into my first jujitsu competition um, in a week and a half. I just uh, signed up for uh, today. Very uh, impulsive decision. I, I, I'm not really sure why I did it. And I signed up for under 175 div division, 175 pounds. And I'm currently Wait, under 175? Around... Yes. You're not one under 175. No, you? no. <laughs> right now I'm at 180, 82. So I need to lose seven pounds in about nine days. So if you guys have any recommendations on how to do that, I did not have a single meal uh, today. It's uh, 3 p.m. I did not uh, eat yet. Uh, but yeah, if you guys have any recommendations on how to eat 
less and still get good results in terms of energy um, and how to lose uh, seven pounds in about nine days, let me know in the comments below. I will try do you to like be... sweat it. Do you huh? sweat it out before the weigh-in? Like, is that how you do it? You're just like... I'm going to try not to do that. No, 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 no. I, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to go. No, those are the guys that sweat or lose 20 pounds in like seven days. Um, like those are the real weight bullies. I'm going to be a weight bully, but actually I'm not even sure if I'm going to be considered a weight bully. But basically I'm trying to lose some pounds before my first uh, competition. Um, so, yeah, that should be interesting. Anyway, let me know play, in the comments. Play chess tournament. Every time I play a tournament, <laughs> I lose weight. Yes, yes. Well, the thing is, I did lose a lot of weight. Not that much, but I was under 180, which I haven't been in a very long time, um, after the US Championship. So that was commentary. Um, mm -hmm. I guess work, you know, this type of like regimented, scheduled uh, work. Well, you're probably like standing up for so long and you don't eat anything, right? That's also true. Yes. Like you, st you stand up for six hours, so you're burning calories and you're not eating a thing or very little. Like that's what I think happens during chess tournaments. Because people thought, how, how could you possibly lose 10 pounds during a chess tournament? But there's like a six hour window where you basically don't eat. Yeah. Which is is probably a, a big part of the reason, right? That's That's my guess at least. Yeah. And then, you know, there's the nerves also that don't make you hungry throughout the day that much. Uh, at least mm -hmm. that's the case for me. Um, so yeah, a lot of things are, I, I'll, I'll keep you updated for sure. Um, I'll keep everybody updated if we manage to squeeze in another one before the rapid and blitz. But that's, that's the plan right now. All right, cool. Off for uh, this week. Great catching up with you. I'll see you soon in St. Louis. And um, um, yeah. I guess see everybody in a few days, maybe a week. See you guys. Cheers. All right. See you guys.